Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. While Italy's Sicilian Mafia, Hong Kong's triads, and Japan's Yakuza may well be some of its best-known examples, organized criminality is present in every country, and South Korea is no exception. Yet, while this is a popular topic for Korean movies, in practice, the general public knows little about this criminal underworld, and even fewer can speak about it from personal experience. We were lucky to interview Johnson Porteux, who spent a year doing research in the company of both gang members and law enforcement officials. Johnson Porteux is assistant professor at Hosei University in Japan. In his dissertation, he explored how the Korean state and criminal gangs interact, and how the former tolerates and even utilized the violence offered by the latter. We spoke about his personal experiences, the historical origins of the Korean government's cooperation with criminal gangs, and the modus vivendi of these criminals. Professor Porteux completed his BA in economics at the University of California, Berkeley, and earned his PhD in political science from the University of Michigan. Professor Johnson Porteux, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So the question we ask all of our interviewees is, why did you come to Korea in the first place? Well, I studied economics as an undergrad. Uh, and when I was studying economics, I got interested in transition economies. So from command economies to more market-based ones. And for my thesis, I decided to look at what was going on in North Korea at that time. Uh, and through my early uh, research, I found that there, was, there were a lot of topics on the Korean peninsula that were not well studied, at least by Western scholars. So I thought, you know, I'm interested in doing a PhD in political science, political economy, uh, and that would be a really interesting area for my research. And so that's basically how I got interested in terms of the academic side. And also there in my, uh, I'm from the Bay Area in California, and there are a lot of Koreans and Korean Americans there. So I had kind of an early introduction that's where a lot of my fascination with Korea kind of really began. The topic of today's interview is organized criminality and its relationship to the state. How did you get into that topic? It's a fairly specific one. Well, when I started my PhD at Michigan, uh, I was interested in comparative politics. I was interested in state development, democratization. In the process of doing my coursework, the former minister of justice in Korea, Kim Jong-gil, uh, he was a visiting scholar at my university. And so through my advisor, I became his, essentially, assistant. Uh, and so my advisor and I were trying to figure out some way to capitalize on that relationship. And again, I'm interested in state development, democratization, and that's one topic in Korea that was not well studied. And also the element of organized crime. I had this fantastic contact which knew a lot about that subject, and so basically that's what we decided to, to look at. Organized criminality and state are not really expected to go hand in hand. What did you learn about this relationship between the two? Well, specifically what I was looking at was not so much organized crime per se, but I was looking at mafia-type groups. So the main difference between mafia-type groups and the broader organized crime groups uh, is that mafias specialize in violence. So they sell protection, essentially, extra-legal protection. And that's exactly what the state does. The state sells legal protection. And so theoretically, we should not see cooperation emerging between these two seemingly opposing groups, but we do. So that was, that was extremely puzzling. So why are they cooperating? That was my main kind of dependent variable, my main question I was trying to explain. An example you describe in your doctoral dissertation is that sometimes criminal mobs are used by officials in Seoul to kick street vendors out of certain areas. That is normally what the state should be doing. Why are those mafia-like groups doing it? That's a really interesting and very complex question, and one that you actually have to look back, look back into Korean history, rather, to really understand. What I found was, so early on in Korean history, you saw the reliance of state actors on these non-state groups because the state was essentially extremely weak at that point, you know, certainly uh, in the post-colonial period. Uh, and you saw tremendous amounts of cooperation, but when the state emerged and, and uh, increased in terms of its capacity, its ability to enforce compliance with what it wanted, you saw reliance on these non-state groups decline. But you saw these types of relationships emerge again in the 1980s and 90s. And so that was really puzzling. The state was, certainly if the state wanted to remove these street vendors, you know, they have the capacity to do so, but they don't. So that was one of my main questions. 
And one of the answers I found was uh, the political calculation. Uh, so a lot of these street vendors, they have an incentive in escalating violence to actually get the police involved, because once the police get involved, society starts to pay attention. And when society starts to pay attention, the state has to worry about being punished by society for, for example, uh, acts that are deemed maybe illiberal or violence is deemed too excessive. Uh, so in one case, you'll have, let's say, the middle class uh, in Korea demanding that the state remove these street vendors. So they're, certain complaints are they're a nuisance, they're there illegally, uh, they're crowding the streets, they might be selling the same goods as those that are, as the businesses that are, that are there that are paying huge rents uh, and taxes and so on. So society wants them to be removed or elements of society wants them to be removed. But at the same time, they threaten to punish the state for these violent acts. So one way around it is to use these non-state groups, uh, referred to as yonyok companies, uh, which specialize in these types of force removals. So once you take the police out of it, this equation, the level of politicization is actually uh, declines. When you set out to explore the background of this cooperation in 2010 and 2011, you did so in an unusual way, let's say, not so much in books, but by actually having a qualitative study interviewing people both on the side of the law and on the side of those mafia groups. How did you gain access to those two groups of people? The first side of the equation, the public side of the equation, so politicians and bureaucrats and so on, was actually relatively easy. And that access came principally from the former Minister of Justice, Kim Jong-il. Uh, most prosecutors would not have given me the time of day if it, not were, if it were not for his initial introductions. And so that side was pretty well developed before I came to Korea. Uh, and I had my, my surveys all created and approved, uh, and my study was all designed and uh, ready to go. And so when I came to Korea, I didn't expect uh, that I was going to have much access to the other side of the equation, to the supply side, let's say, to these non-state specialists, the gangsters and right-wing groups and so on. Uh, and I was fine with that. I figured out that I could, I could do a pretty good study without having to rely on those sources or tap into those sources. But through my course of, of being here in Korea, by chance, I met certain people that were connected to these mafia-type groups. And through those connections, I was able to expand my network. And I also relied on various things that are, I believe are quite unique to Korea in terms of, of school networks and uh, regional networks, uh, military networks, and so on. Uh, and so, for example, you might have people that are from uh, the Honam region in Korea who are living in Seoul, well, they'll all meet together periodically. And so you'll have school teachers in the same room with you know, CEOs and uh, military generals and then also sometimes gangsters and politicians and so on. So it facilitates these types of meetings and also facilitated my introductions and the expansion of my network. So what were your days like during the time you actually did your study in Korea? Usually pretty boring. There was a lot of coffee during the day and a lot of drinks during the night. Uh, and a lot of it was just sitting down and observing and listening. Uh, and so, of course, before I had come to Korea, I had a list of all the questions. And, and these were the types of questions I was going to ask. Uh, and these were the types of people I was going to ask them too. Police officers, bureaucrats, uh, and certainly gangsters don't like to be interviewed. Right? And so when I, when I started out, and that was my method, I learned quickly on that I was not really getting that far. So I basically you know, threw out my, all those questions, and I just started meeting them more informally and just showing up uh, for lunch and hanging out for the day and seeing who was coming in and out of the office, you know, going to dinners with them and, and a couple of trips to Busan and, and so on. Uh, and that's where a lot of my rich data came from. So just kind of observing what was going on. Uh, and every once in a while, asking a question here or there or clarifications and so on. And yeah, so I heard that it was, it, was, it was these types of relationships in the 1960s is the same way now. So why is that? Certain questions that I was allowed to ask uh, or certain questions, that, let's say, they were tolerated because I was a foreigner. Uh, if I was Korean, those types of questions would have, I think, much more quickly become annoying. And so that was a major, major advantage that I had over a Korean researcher. Were both sides aware at all time that you were actually conducting research? Or did some people discover that afterwards? For my own safety, I was upfront with everybody, telling them exactly what I was doing. So if I was meeting with uh, these gangsters, I would, the first time I would meet them, I would tell them 
I was a PhD student from the United States and I was conducting this study. And please do not tell me anything you would not want anybody else to know. Uh, so I don't want to know uh, certain types of activities that the police might want to know, those types of things. So I want to understand the big picture, essentially, not kind of individual crimes and so on. Uh, so everybody knew exactly what I was doing. I was not trying to infiltrate the mafia. I was trying to be extremely transparent. That gets into the question of safety. That was also for my safety, right? So the biggest threat to me, I think, would be if I did something wrong or said something wrong and they no longer would meet me. So that was the biggest kind of threat. So no kind of, no real kind of dangerous aspects. And one of that is because I was extremely upfront with them. The police knew exactly what I was doing and who I was meeting with, uh, and so did the gangsters. Was there a rite of passage that you had to undertake to actually be accepted as a bystander that would be there doing quite a lot of interactions? Well, for people who don't know, and I think everyone actually does, Koreans like to drink every now and again. Uh, and so this is not particular to, let's say, uh, specialists in violence. I think this is, this is pretty prevalent throughout Korean society, but you know, meeting together and drinking and being able to, let's say, hold your liquor and uh, still behave in an appropriate manner. So those, you know, I had to go through that quite a bit. Uh, and then meeting them over time and so on and getting them to know my face and know exactly what I'm doing. So that was, I guess that could be a, considered a rite of passage, but those same rites of passage uh, happen at universities or happen in, in businesses and, and so on. So organized crime, let's say, is not an outlier in that, in that aspect. Were you ever met with resistance from people who were there and who just did not want you around? Well, there are certainly some people that had strong opinions on uh, U.S. foreign policy and Americans in general. They would ask, so why are you here? What are you doing? But I also benefited from the fact that my, one of my initial contacts is actually quite well respected in that world. And basically, by his, through his permission, they basically had to tolerate me. I say, but there were there were certainly people that expressed their opinions, and and uh, not everybody was was willing to be my best friend. Let's say. Maybe a naive question is: How did the Korean mafia actually compare to the mafia most people would think of, that of movies such as from The Godfather? Korean organizations are much more fragmented, uh, and they're much more fluid over time, and so it actually makes studying the Korean mafia much more difficult than, say, studying. Yamaguchi Gumi uh, Yakuza group in Japan, where you actually do have a lot more kind of formalized organization and continuity over time. Uh, and so these groups, you might have the same group that has continuity going back, let's say, 30 years, but the names change and the names reflect uh, the name of the boss. Uh, or if they, they shift areas or if their office goes to a different area, uh, then the name will change. And they're much more fluid and fragmented And there's a lot more cooperation between the different groups. So the probability of finding a member of Yamaguchi Gumi and Sumiyoshi Kai uh, working together kind of systematically, I think the probability is much lower than seeing that type of relationship in Korea. And so I see a lot more kind of smaller type groups, but overall, in terms of numbers, in terms of a percentage of society, it's higher in Korea. And it seems to operate a little bit better in Korea in terms of the cooperation than it would in uh, other countries. The main thing is we don't have these, these huge kind of monolithic groups. And when I first came to Korea and I was meeting with prosecutors and I was asking them about the Korean mafia, and the first thing they told me is that there is no Korean mafia. Uh, there's nothing like there, there exists in Japan or in Italy or other places like that, where there, or the Russian mafia, let's say. And that's because what their model for what a mafia is are these kind of monolithic, huge organizations, which Korea doesn't have, but there is still mafias. There are still groups which do, in fact, have continuity over time and which do specialize in violence. Uh, so that was the first thing that I had to understand in order to begin to uh, investigate the Korean mafia, let's say. So going back, before talking about today, Looking back at history, in your dissertation, you describe how criminal gangs played, and I quote, a tremendously influential role in the development of the state prior to the 1961 military coup d'etat by Pak Chong-hee. What function did they actually perform during these years? Well, in 1945, there essentially in Korea, in the post-colonial period, there was really no state. So there are a tremendous amount of state seekers, but there was no state, and the state elements that were there had very low levels of capacity. 
And so the first thing you need to do in terms of state formation is you need to have a monopolization or a near monopolization over the means and use of violence. And so that's what these non-state groups essentially facilitated. Uh, and so the leftists had their non-state groups and the rightists had theirs. And essentially any group, any political group without one of these violent factions was not to be taken seriously. And so they were used, utilized, and harnessed by these state seekers for gaining that supremacy. And that supremacy eventually fell under the hands of, of uh, Lee Sung Man. So what about after Lee Sung Man's rise to power? These groups continued to play a tremendously influential role in terms of Korean politics. State development is essentially not like publishing the book, where you publish it and you're done. You continue to have to get people to subscribe to what you're essentially selling. Right? So state development is an ongoing process. The fact that the state had come under the control of Lee Sung Man early on didn't mean that he had complete power. So what he had to do is to expand that power, and there's still a tremendous amount of competitors to Lee Sung Man, uh, and then after Lee Sung Man, under Park Chung Hee. And so these groups were used to maintain or expand that power until the state sources of coercion emerged and reached a point uh, to where they were able to essentially do it themselves. And once the state reached that, that level of capacity, you saw these collaborative relationships, anything systematic, substantially decline, right? There was no need. Early on, there was no state, so they had to create it. And so that's what these groups helped to do. So to create it, to maintain it, and then to expand it until these state sources emerged. As Korea democratized in the 80s and 90s, you write that those same periods are actually the heydays of organized crime in Seoul. How is that possible? Well, during the 80s, there was actually niche markets that opened up for them. So you had Chun Do Hwan in the mid 80s, essentially trying to hold on to power where you had his power being continually contested. One way that he tried to placate society is through his 3S program, uh, screen, sex, and sports. And so you had this basically this entertainment industry rise up and gambling and prostitution Certain elements might have been legal, others not legal but tolerated, but essentially you had markets opening up. And you had these organized groups, non-state violence-wheeling groups, which were competing over these markets. And so it was the heyday in terms of, of let's say, money-making ability, uh, but it was also the heyday in terms of violent interactions between these groups. Is it fair to say that as democracy gained ground in Korea, state violence against his constituent became more and more illegitimate and that it had to turn towards less legal but also less visible means of imposing violence on the people, in this case, organized criminality. That's my main argument. So rather than being weak capacity, which is driving this outcome that I'm interested in, it's actually a political calculation. So how do they get this policy through or enforced while at the same time avoiding potential political backlash for the means with which uh, were utilized or used to carry that policy out. Violence by the state, it has essentially a uh, multiplying effect in terms of the level of politicization. So one way to avoid that politicization while still reaching those goals is to seek outside to the market. And so that's essentially what these groups are providing. They're allowing the state to realize certain types of goals without actually having to pay the cost. If we look at Korea today, two decades later, how many gangs are there still in Korea? And how many members do they have? In which city do they operate? That's actually a very difficult question to answer, uh, in part because the way they're organized is it's essentially by design to make it very difficult to study. Uh, and to find out how many groups are operating and where they're operating and the numbers they're operating. Uh, but I got some pretty reliable data in terms of looking at Korea or South Korea as a whole uh, from the prosecutor's office. And so in 2006, and these, a lot of these were based on estimates, but it was estimated to be about 50,000 uh, members all throughout uh, South Korea, with some of the highest concentrations being in Gyeonggi-do and Seoul, and then the Gyeongsang-do region would be the highest concentrations uh, and highest numbers of groups. The example we mentioned earlier about the street vendors actually happened in Insadong, a touristic district of Seoul, 
But of course, those groups also operate in other cities. Are there regional differences? Is there a different culture of gangsterism in different cities? I wish I knew the answer to that question. Uh, and I'll be honest, is most of my research was focused in Seoul. So I was very specific in my question, trying to understand why would these political actors cooperate with these non-state specialists in violence, right, that were operating uh, outside of the state's jurisdiction. Uh, and I didn't really need to do a whole study over throughout Korea to answer that. I have, though, anecdotally heard that there are uh, relationships in, the, let's say, the Chibang area, uh, anywhere below Seoul, are typically stronger. So you have these direct regional ties. So there's already a strong relationship there. And the police know the gangsters and they know the mayor and they know uh, all these other political actors and business actors because they grew up with them. So I'd assume that some of those relationships are stronger and closer in those areas just by that fact. But it's, it's, it's very difficult for me to give you a very good answer on that just because I haven't studied that question in any kind of detail. What is the structure of those groups internally? How do they work on a daily basis? Well, the structure is similar in many respects to, let's say, Japanese Yakuza. So you'll have, at the top, you'll have an oyabun, or a big boss, and then below him, you'll have the underboss, uh, and you also have the advisor, gomun, uh, and below them, they have the captains, uh, and then below them, the, I guess, soldiers would be the easiest way to, to translate it. And so that, that looks very similar to what's going on in Japan, very similar to what, let's say, the Cosa Nostra in, in the United States would look like. There is a difference, and one of the differences in terms of, of, let's say, the organization and the operation of these groups is that the Japanese Yakuza and the American uh, Cosa Nostra, money goes from the bottom up. So from the bottom, from the soldiers, uh, and they pay essentially rents to the top and percentages to the top. Uh, in Korea, it's top down. So a boss that has more money can employ more people below him uh, and can expand his power that way. Uh, and so that's a major difference. There are only a few groups that operate in a similar way as, uh, say, Japanese Yakuza bottom-up. For the most part, in Seoul, it's all top-down. And oftentimes, the soldiers below the various bosses, they can gravitate to other, essentially, power brokers or to other oyabun. And so I, th I found that to be quite interesting and perhaps unique to Korea, something that I didn't actually read about in other, in other instances. Those gangsters have for business violence, but is there a lot of intergroup violence? Do they fight each other from captain to captain or whatnot? Well, that's actually a really interesting question. Uh, and so earlier you asked me about the heyday of organized crime in the 80s and 90s, uh, and I explained they were making money, but there was also a tremendous amount of competition and a tremendous amount of violence between these groups. During that time period, a lot of these top bosses and members, they were arrested in various uh, organized crime, uh, crackdown uh, raids and campaigns by the Korean police. They were put in the same jails, and that actually facilitated uh, cooperation between these groups. Uh, and so what's interesting is there are these, of course, there's the internal organizations of the various groups that they have, but there's also uh, organizations which facilitate cooperation between these groups. And so the bosses will meet periodically in various hotels and they'll resolve disputes. So there is essentially a dispute resolving mechanism that has emerged uh, in the post 1990s period in Korea. Uh, and that the existence of that dispute resolving mechanism has led to a decline in kind of violent altercations and interactions between these groups. So actually there's uh, not a lot of there are cases where there's competition over various uh, industries and bidding processes and so on, uh, but for the most part, there are peaceful relations and disputes are resolved before they actually culminate into violence. Well, two questions. First, do they just rent a hotel venue and just say it's for that, or do they pretend to be something else during those meetings? And secondly, how is the division of opportunities done? Is it a group will have a specific type of business, or is it more grounded in geography? A group will have Kwanaku, for example. In Korea, it's really easy to meet people. You have all of these uh, uh, different events, whether it's the uh, regional meeting, the, the let's say uh, people from Honam, the Honam Hyanghui, the Honam Association and their meeting. Uh, so there are many, many chances to for these members to 
interact with each other. Uh, but there are also these meetings that are specifically set up for the purpose of, for lack of a better word, kind of syndicate, op operating the syndicate, so to speak. And they'll meet in a hotel and they'll rent uh, a space there and they'll have these meetings and they'll have lunch and they're, they're uh, set up for that purpose. Uh, but for the most part, there are also weddings that they go to. And if you get a wedding invitation uh, from somebody, that means that you are part of that group. Uh, and if you go, you have to pay some type of honorarium. Uh, so it could be depending upon which group you're going to or whose wedding it is or, or whoever's getting married, who their boss is. So the more important the person, the higher the amount the person attending will pay. Uh, and those fees collected are essentially the syndicate dues. Uh, so I asked one of the bosses one time roughly how much uh, they're spending for these meetings, these quasi kind of meetings, and he said about four to five thousand dollars per month if I use dollars. So about uh, sabek mawan or obek mawan every month just for these meetings, which they're going to these meetings because they're facilitating cooperation, and cooperation uh, leads to more profits. Uh, so rather than fighting, they're actually cooperating and making money. In terms of territory. It was explained to me that the soul is essentially, it's essentially a free market, so to speak. So it's not so much based on region uh, or area, or like so Guanagu or Zhongnogu, uh, but it might be based on industry. And so you have some groups that are operating in um, the entertainment industry uh, or some that are operating in the construction industry uh, and so on. And so it's, it's essentially soul is a free market. Outside of Seoul, which I've, I've studied less, I've heard it's much more kind of regional-based territories. And so in Busan, you'll have, you actually have four different types of Chusongpa. I think there's one, the Heunde Chusongpa or something like that. And that will, they control Heunde, that area right there. But again, I haven't really studied that much outside of Seoul. How visible are those groups? Would the average salaryman working for Samsung or another Chebol actually ever come in contact to realize that he's interacting with someone uh, from a gang? Yeah, in Korea, again, it's very, very easy to meet these individuals. And especially gangsters that are retired speak about it fairly openly and, and quite proudly sometimes. There's, so they don't use the word gangster or, or they certainly don't use the word gangpe or chojik bongyokpe. They use the word kondar. And kondar has this kind of romantic image to it. And so they'll th say things like, you know, kondardri mutwenenidi opta. They'll say, like, there's no job a gangster can't do. And so they're very kind of proud of it. And it's very kind of hyper-masculine world. So it's, it's not so difficult to run into these individuals. And again, these, so the regional meetings, the school ties, uh, the military ties, all of these types of networks facilitate those types of interactions. And is it safe for the average Korean who is not himself or herself involved in those activities is it safe to meet those people or to actually go to business related to those people? Well, I would not become business partners, let's say, with them. I don't want my interactions to have any effect on their, let's say, economic well-being. So as long as I don't affect their ability to make money, we can be friends, let's say. We can meet and, and interact with each other. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I was safe. So I was of no severe consequence to them. Uh, they didn't depend upon me, for example, to keep any information secret. And I asked them not to tell me anything secret because I didn't want to push those, those boundaries. Uh, and I also wanted to keep myself safe. Uh, and so I think for the most part, they have a very strong incentive to constrain their violence. When they actually have to utilize their violence, well, something's going on. People are questioning them. They're competing there or they're, they're questioning their power. And so they actually don't want to have to use their violence. So everything works well through the threat of violence, where people are just afraid and they follow. But in terms of the amount of violence, it's, it's actually quite rare. You wrote that Korean thugs, in addition to long knives, typically employ iron rods, baseball bats, axes, swords, and fire extinguishers as their weapons of choice. Against whom is that violence targeted if there is so little violence? Well, just because violence between these groups is rare doesn't mean that it never occurs. So it, it, it's a low probability, but it's not a zero probability. Sometimes these weapons are needed and, and, and stashes of these weapons are needed just in case between these groups. 
so who else would the violence be directed at? Well, their second largest income or source of income is, is through something the prosecutor's office called uh, activity referred to as hired thugs. Uh, and so they are employed by various uh, sources for, let's say, forced evictions. Uh, so removing tenants uh, who might be protesting uh, new development projects, maybe less for, for uh, street vendors and so on. Uh, so there are instances where they might need those, those weapons in hand or have access to those weapons. Is racket of small businesses or whatnot actually one of their main activities? It was explained to me that extortion, the rate of extortion has gone down dramatically. Uh, and so they've shifted their businesses. It's very difficult to make money through those types of rackets. So as a percentage of their income, I believe it's actually quite low. And I didn't, that wasn't directly related to my dissertation, so I didn't focus too much on that, on that question. But overall, I got from a number of sources, uh, both from the public and the non-public side, uh, that that is a declining practice. Uh, and you might see it uh, in older entertainment districts and so on. Uh, but for the most part, it's not a huge aspect or, or a huge activity that they engage in anymore. And before discussing the relationship with the state in greater detail, maybe one more question about their activities. Do they actually restrain petty criminality unrelated to different groups? Oh, yeah, they do. So one of the powers that a lot of these groups have is that a lot of younger people, a lot of younger, let's say, unorganized thugs eventually want to become Kondar, right? So because they want to become Kondar, they restrain their activities. Uh, so let's say the uh, police, they can't be everywhere at all time. Uh, and so they have a hierarchy of, of preferences. Uh, so they might say prostitution is bad, but certain type of prostitution is worse than others. So they might have some type of cooperative relationship where the police might allow one group to operate or engage in kind of a tolerated activity uh, and then restrain those untolerated activities. And so these groups help to regulate unorganized activities. And they do it pretty well because, again, one, a lot of these younger unorganized groups eventually want to rise to the ranks and become kondar and, and so on, but also because these kondar don't have to follow any due process, right? So if you see a gangster show up and he has a baseball bat or an ax, that could be a lot more threatening than seeing a police officer in present-day democratic Korea. Not always the case in Korea, but right now, that's a pretty safe bet. You describe these gangs as part of a larger state business criminal nexus. Could you explain how these gangs are actually linked to the state and to private businesses? So these relationships you can think about businesses and organized crime groups. Uh, so businesses provide these, let's say, these thugs with money-making opportunities. Right? So you see these, these uh, basically organized criminals assisting these businesses and businesses providing them more money-making opportunities again. And then you have businesses, of course, linked to politicians. Uh, and so a business will provide, let's say, campaign finance, and then the politicians will provide some type of support. And then you also have criminals linked to police and prosecutors. And so, of course, police are tasked with enforcing the state's rules. They can't be everywhere at all times. So rather than trying to, let's say, eradicate organized crime, which is extremely difficult to do, if not impossible, they'll regulate it. And so there's, there's a relationship that might develop there between the police and prosecutors and these criminal groups. So rather than trying to eradicate it and having unorganized crime with higher externalities, they enter into these cooperative agreements. And then, of course, you have police and prosecutors linked to politicians. So politicians depend upon bureaucrats in general and police and, and prosecutors for enforcing this will and, and, and maintaining order and so on. And, of course, police and prosecutors depend upon politicians maybe for uh, advancement of some, some type. So you have these different linkages that are fluid over time. And so you, you don't often see these direct relationships anymore between politicians and criminal groups just because it's become much more costly for these politicians if these relationships are revealed. And so oftentimes they're indirect. And so a politician might depend upon an organized crime group for grassroots political organization. And so rather than going directly, they'll go to their business contacts and their business contacts will go towards, uh, will hire these thugs. Oftentimes those that were 
in business or those that are in business, oftentimes they've gotten to that point, uh, let's say successful point, based on kind of a murky past. Maybe they themselves have been kundar and then over time they reached a certain point where they could largely be legitimate. That doesn't mean that all of their activities are legitimate, right? Just like it doesn't mean that all of the activities of the organized criminals are illegitimate, right? There's a range there. And so sometimes relationships will develop based on, let's say, uh, mutual cooperation in a legal business, let's say, and then that might spill over into other areas which are a little bit less clear. You argue that the criminal police prosecutorial linkage is perhaps the most resilient. Why is that? There's a tremendous amount of interaction between the police and prosecutors and these groups, right? And so they, they meet each other uh, frequently on the streets or they get involved in various criminal investigations. And so there's a lot of chances for them to essentially meet, right? And so it's the police and prosecutors who are charged with enforcing the rules, right? And so, you know, there are chances for them to meet. How systematic are those linkages? Or rather, to rephrase it, can you succeed in either of those worlds without actually being in contact with your counterpart in the other world? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer. When I talk about these relationships, I want to be careful to state that not all police have these relationships with these gangsters, and not all these politicians have these indirect relationships with these gangsters or, or quasi-corrupt business individuals and so on. But when they do exist, here's how it looks. Here's how it's essentially organized. Here are the motivations and the incentives and so on. And so there are many ways in which to, to be successful as a prosecutor or as a police officer or as a, a business individual or as a politician without having these types of linkages. How high do those linkages actually go? That's also another very good question. Uh, and one that is also very, very difficult to answer uh, because it depends upon what type of relationship you're talking about, where it's a relationship where illegal outcomes you know, are the result, probably less and less and less the higher up you go. That doesn't mean there, there's not indirect relationships and so on. Uh, and a lot of these high-ranking politicians now, oftentimes if they are in the, let's say, the Chibang area and they were local young politicians and they had to rely on these types of, of individuals or assistance from in terms of campaign finance and so on, early on these relationships might have developed. It doesn't mean that there's these corrupt practices that are, that are continuing to, to occur, even though there still might be a relationship there. Again, in Korea, it's very difficult not to have a relationship, either direct or indirect, uh, with these groups just because, one, Korea's you know, it's 50 million people. It's not, you know, 300 and, you know, 25 million people or so on. You know, and it's also a country that, that I think it would be the, the 12th largest state if it was in the United States. So it's not a, you know, there's not a whole lot of, of land space here. You know, so you run into people. These relationships exist and they exist at varying levels, but it doesn't always mean that these relationships are always based on kind of criminality and so on. What role does the public actually play in this state business criminal nexus? How much awareness does it have of these practices and what attitude does it have towards it? I don't have surveys about the public's perception of organized crime or how developed it is or not. I think the general perception is uh, there is, of course, organized crime in Korea, but a common phrase would be pieja omnim bomje. So a lot of it is victimless crime. There's not a lot of predatory crime, I think, is, is the perception. I think that perception is right. There's a tremendous amount of victimless. It depends, of course, how you define victimless crime. I've seen articles uh, written where they estimate about upwards of 20% of 25% of the South Korean economy is kind of these black market type activities. I'm not sure how accurate those numbers are, but I think there's a pretty general perception that it exists, but it's not a major issue in Korea. You ask in your dissertation, why would the Korean society, and I quote now, not punish the state for allowing such violent practices to occur? What is your answer? In the cases that I studied, I looked at uh, labor suppression. I looked at forced evictions. And I looked at uh, forced uh, uh, removal of street vendors. And in each of those cases, you had the general sentiment, the public's feeling that they wanted the state to achieve, let's say, 
cheap goods and services which required and keep the engine of Korea incorporated going, which depended upon cheap labor prices. And you also had uh, the general public demanding cheaper uh, housing and better infrastructure, which required uh, removing dilapidated buildings, which required removing tenants, many of which might not be able to afford uh, the new housing in Seoul, and they might be pushed out. So they had an incentive to to essentially fight back. Uh, And you have these street vendors, and a lot of people agreeing that they are actually involved in many times illegal activities. So they're they're selling goods without paying taxes, for example. Uh, So there's a collective preference for removing these groups or more regulation. Uh, So you have society demanding these outcomes, but also being very watchful of the way the state carries it out. Uh, And this aspect, or my answer, is very, very specific to Korea, and it has to do uh, with the history of dictatorship uh, and colonial rule in Korea and the role that the police played in terms of the violence. And so there's symbolic valence, there's symbolic meaning, right? So when people see the police engaged in these violent activities, it harkens back to that authoritarian period, and they react very differently. So the involvement of the police in these violent actions has a very uh, different effect on society uh, in Korea than it would, say, in uh, San Francisco. Right? The public view it differently because the history is different. Do we see collaboration between the organized criminality in South Korea and other groups in other countries, such as obviously the Yakuza's in Japan, but also some maybe American groups or Russian groups? Do we see any international collaboration? There is, from what I've heard, anecdotally, cooperation between uh, groups, let's say, in Busan and groups in Japan. But it's very difficult for me to, to say definitively that you know, there are these systematic types of relationships that occur. You might have certain criminal elements in Korea that might be of, let's say, Russian origin that cooperate with Russian groups in Russia. Uh, So there's a lot more of that, or ethnic Chinese in Korea cooperating with Chinese in China or Taiwan. Uh, So you do see that, but again, that's kind of outside the scope of my dissertation, so I can't, I don't have a good answer. A common depiction of East Asian criminality, especially when organized, is something ultra-violent. You'll have Yakuza movie or Triad movies with a lot of blood, a lot of action, a lot of killings. Certainly there are violent individuals and there are violent factions and there is violence that emerges from time to time. But for the most part, conflict is resolved short of actual violent conflict. The way it works, so in equilibrium, is is the threat of violence. Margaret Thatcher, for example, she's famous for saying that power is like a lady. If you have to tell people, you're probably not. Well, that's that's very similar. If somebody has to actually utilize violence, that might signal their potential weakness or the perception of others that they are weak and therefore they can be challenged. For the most part, all of these violent interactions and these violence games played out during the 80s and 90s. And so we've reached essentially a a largely cooperative period. And these groups also have an incentive in making money today and tomorrow and in the future. And violence is really bad for business. And if they utilize violence and the public becomes aware, then the police have to do something about it. Uh, So they have a a strong incentive to settle conflict short of violence, and they do a pretty good job of it. But it's not, you know, sensational. It doesn't make, again, for great TV or great film. So that kind of aspect is, is typically not highlighted. The other thing is that the vast majority of these individuals are not sociopaths. You know, they are individual, normal, kind of rational people. And, and they reflect society. There are those that can be very interesting to be around and you know, sometimes fun to be around. Not everyone, but of course there are. Uh, but it's just like every other subset of society. How has your perception of those groups changed since before you started doing your field work? Well, I certainly understand them and their organization a lot better. And because I interacted with them on a kind of a human level, Uh, I developed various relationships with with lots of diverse individuals, uh, and so it brings a bit of kind of humanity to it, and so I understand a little bit more about why they might have chosen uh, the options that they they did, and so understanding certain types of outcomes. To conclude, is there an anecdote or something you would like to share with the audience 
I guess the anecdote or the the incident that had the greatest the greatest effect on me was actually witnessing you know violence being carried out in broad daylight. This was in in Sedong, and I saw about a hundred and fifty or so of these thugs wearing yellow vests and going from one end of in Sedong to the other, stopping at each cart, uh, destroying that. And you have the street vendors there. There's a huge kind of gray area here in terms of, of cause and, and who's the victim there. Uh, rather, street vendors are trying to escalate the violence. But actually seeing that visibly and seeing one, you know, harmony, one, uh, one older uh, street vendor in her 80s, and she had blood on her face, and she was asking uh, one of the police officers who was there, they were standing on each you know, side, essentially protecting the buildings, but allowing this process to occur asking the police officer, why aren't you protecting us? Why aren't you stopping us? We're citizens of, of Dehan Minguk and, and those kind of things. And that really kind of affected me and seeing that, that kind of systematic violence and then also seeing the toleration for it and the fact that it wasn't big news in Korea. And so that's a question that I'm still trying to... I have, I have some answers and I'm trying to, to make those answers better. But that was, you know, in my whole year of field work, that was the single incident that probably had the largest effect on me. Professor Porte, thank you so much for your time. Thank you again for having me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.